Hello everyone, I'm Brian and welcome back. Let's go ahead and continue. <laughs> the professor told me, keep your ad an Advaita outside the door, Swami, because he knew I would mix it up with this. So you learn it separately and then... Um, but interestingly, outside the class, just outside the Harvard Yard, I ran into this Buddhist Lama, uh, Lama Migmar. If you look him up, later on I realized he's quite an eminent person. He is the Buddhist chaplain, Tibetan Buddhist chaplain for Harvard University. I just ran in, into him in the street and he looked at me and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm studying your philosophy. And he was very happy. He wanted to know which books I'm studying and all of that. And he I recommended some more books. And then he said, but you are a non-dualist, an Advaitic monk. I said, yes. Oh, it's the same. <laughs> And, but how it's the same, we'll come to it at the end. So the second one, that you are apart, Atma self is apart from body and mind. All the arguments that I have ge given are logically good. Vivekananda himself says, but have, who has ever seen it separately? Uh -huh. The pure consciousness by itself. It can't be, logically you can't experience, even if it's there, you can't experience it. Um, you need body-mind to certify. Then Chandrakirti says, we are back to the hails, the, the sheaves of hay, one depending on the other. How do you know one exists without the other? Then the third option is, well, does the chariot exist in the parts? You know, there is, I see the parts, so in that there is a SUV, there is a chariot, in, in the parts of the chariot. One uh, commentator, Tibetan commentator, he says, like a bowl in which berries are kept. So the parts of the chariot are there. In that there is a chariot. Obviously not. That, that's silly. That relationship is also not there. And the Atma also. Nobody till today. If you say body, mind is there, there is an Atma. Search the body. However much you search the body, do um, uh, surgery, find out here in the heart, somewhere the heart, uh, Atma is there, or in the brain, somewhere inside there is the Atma. And philosophers have thought about it. Pineal gland, Descartes. The point of the interaction of the mind and body, things like that. But nothing, it's just body. The more and more you search, it's just body. One um, um, doctor from Scotland, Indian doctor, he wrote to me that I had an epiphany. I had been examining scans of the body for the last few decades in my career. Just today, I saw a scan and it just struck me. I am not that. There's no me in any of that. It's just a machine, it's a thing. It's a thing. True, there is no Atma in this body. I mean, literally speaking, we talk about in there. You know, Vedantic language, you are the Atma in there. Pratyak, inner self. Buddhist, the Buddhist Chandrakirti says, all right, I'll take you seriously. Show me, literally, show me where is it inner, how is it inner. Uh, Upanishad, Atma tu ratinam vidhi, shadiram ratamevatu. The self is the passenger and the um, body is the chariot. Curiously, Chandrakirti's chariot doesn't have a passenger, mm -hmm. <laughs> very tellingly. So, the passenger is in the SUV, in the chariot. Good, Let me exa let's examine the chariot, let's examine the body. Where is the passenger? So, no, 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 it's not the body, you don't understand. It's the mind, you're in the mind. Examine the mind, where is the, where is the Atma? You find only thoughts, memories, ideas, pleasure, pain, desire. <clears throat> huh. Speaking about that, is there, when you look into, you, I, again, I, I didn't study so much in, in, too much in the brain stuff, but is there a way to, um, you know, like you were saying, it's like, oh, look in the brain, look in the body, you won't find the Atma, Atma, sorry, Atma. And it's like, well, then he talked about, what about your thoughts, memories, ideas, pleasure, pain? Is that in the brain somewhere? Can you say, where's the pain at in the brain? Or where is the pleasure at in the brain? Where's the memories at? The thoughts in the brain? I don't know if they've figured that part out yet or not. Now, like, uh, uh, you can do a brain scan, and when you think of something, certain things will fire up. And you can say, well, there's the thought. There's the, the memory or the thought or whatever it is that you're thinking of. Well... Is that the thought or is that the Atma in terms of how I try to see it or is that the Atma creating it or thinking of it <clears throat> without that, you know, that initial, how to say, that 
lights up in your brain because whenever they scan your brain any type of activity there's like it will show like a pattern of lights i guess that's how they kind of see it when you see activities in the brain uh, scan activities so when you think of something your your neurons are firing in your brain is that the thought or is that the atma so i know in this in this scenario uh in advaita vedanta the atma is uh who you who you are which is unaffected by the body and mind something separate that's kind of illuminating the body and mind. And my 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 theory, um, so are the materialist, which is the pinky, my theory, and then Advaita Vedanta. My theory, at least, I don't want to say theory, but my thoughts is the fact that the Atma, as being described in Advaita Vedanta, maybe is somewhere in the mind. But again, it, to me, uh, Advaita Vedanta and my own theory are both equally true just because I never experienced any of it. I know there's this me, now whether that's you know the, a Brahmin or whether that's in my brain, I don't know. So at the moment, both are equally true. It's like, are you in the brain? It's like, yeah, are you Brahmin? Maybe, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, you know? I'm, I'm not, I, there's no, yes, this is it, you know, kind of answer. Just, I guess what has happened as I was watching this is that I went from the materialistic minus I am the brain to now I may be somewhere in the brain, I'm in maybe a spot in the brain, because of what Advaita Vedanta was saying, like where you can start chopping off parts and I start thinking, it's like, well yeah, there are people out there that are missing like half their brain or something else missing in their brain or parts of their body and it's not them. But my theory is just the fact that maybe it's a certain part of the brain. Uh, waking, dreaming, sleeping, where is Atma in the mind? Where is this internal soul, unchanging, independent soul in the mind? David Hume, the great Scottish philosopher, he says, I examine my internal states and I find a steady procession of dispositions, thoughts, memories, perceptions. I find nothing corresponding to a self. Um, at this That's, hold on, let me rewind that actually. Examine my internal state of David Hume. Yeah, and, and and it goes back to along the lines of what Advaita Vedanta is saying is the fact that you cannot exa you cannot examine the subject. The subject is always the examiner. It's never the examined. So the subject's never the object. So you cannot you know uh, examine my internal states because your internal states is something an, an object separate from the subject. And that's something that I completely agree. I mean, I, I don't know if you can examine oneself. So hold on, let me examine myself. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of actually kind of fun. It's like examine yourself. Make sure you're okay. okay. Hold on. Yeah, this is not me, but I'm examining myself. Kind of deal. Of dispositions, thoughts, memories, perceptions, I find nothing corresponding to a self. Um, at this point, you might say, Swami, tenth man, the observer. <laughs> I know, but we won't go there. So, yeah. Atma is not something contained. Chariot is not contained in the parts like a uh, like as the Tibetan Lama said, like a bowl and with berries in it. There is the parts of the chariot, in that there is a chariot, no. Then this is the, uh, what is the third option? The fourth option is the reverse. The parts are contained in the chariot. So chariot is the basis on which the parts exist. That's also ridiculous, I mean, what does it mean? It's like saying there is a car in which there are the parts. You might say it like that, but you can't talk of, you can't show me any anything like a car apart from the parts. You can show me a, uh, a bowl apart from the berries, but you can't show me a car apart from its parts. Car is not a bowl in which the berries are put. Now this is actually a subtle point when you come to the Atma, because Vedantins talk about, mystics talk about the ground of all existence, as if there is a ground on which uh, everything has been put. Um, so. Atma is the ground of all existence. Uh, so, is there any such ground on which body-mind has been put? There is an Atma on which body-mind rests. Well, Vedantins don't mean it in that yeah, way. Yeah, I was going to say. We'll come to that, what Vedantins mean. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, they don't, I, I don't think they meant literal ground. I think it's just kind of like the foundation of how things exist, how things function. More, more of the idea of it as opposed to the literal ground. Uh, look, I'm standing on Atma. <laughs> <laughs> my own atma it's right down there somewhere but as a ground as a basis on which the um, 
parts exist there's a, there's no such chariot there is no such atma on which the body mind hands and feet and thoughts and all are put in like a like a table and that table is the self no such thing is there who see, who has ever seen such a thing that's the fourth one fifth one was no 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 you are just twisting my words the the dualist will say why when i say atma when i say soul i mean i i am the possessor of this body mind in my body my hands my ears lama sankhapa says sankhapa he says like devadatta who says my ears so uh, like that and so it's interesting how the tibetans in the writing the scriptures they use sanskrit names those are not indian names those were names those are not tibetan names those are names which were used in ancient indian philosophical discourse so devadatta says my ears like that atma is the one which possesses the body my body my mind isn't it how the hindu dualists speak but look at the chariot and its parts <laughs> is there any chariot which possesses its parts the chariot say this is the suv say this is my tires and my engine and my is there any such suv apart from the uh, parts which says i am the owner of this this suv no Uh, I am the owner of these parts. No, there is no such owner. You know, all of these. I am somebody with all these body mind. I own this body mind. I am in this body mind. We all feel this. So, how does Chandrakirti explain this feeling? He says it's an. Not only him, all Buddhists say it's an illusion created by the continuity of body mind. They give the example of Alata Chakra. Uh, a flame if you whirl it round it looks like a circle the fan which you see now it looks like a disk when it moves very fast but it's just one point of flame moving fast similarly flashes of thoughts feelings emotions as they go one after another without ceasing you feel like you are a self i am the self which possesses thoughts feelings emotions body but actually there are only these thoughts feelings emotions body the changes of the body that's all that there is five skandhas five pillars which are continuously changing themselves that's all that there is according to the buddhists now then this is the no possessor there is no self which possesses body mind it, you i feel it you feel it it's not real it's a, it's an illusion generated by the body mind imagine in your dreams also you feel i am here talking to somebody when you wake up neither you were there nor that person was there so that feeling came that i am there but that was an illusion like that this illusion generated by the continuously changing body mind then uh, what is what more is there the sixth option look the chariot is the parts is the combination is the this the parts there the uh -huh. chariot that what you call the chariot the collection of the parts not literally the parts themselves that was the first option Mm. the collection of the parts house of symbols that's what sure. i mean this uh, collection of the parts is the chariot i atma is the collection of mind body consciousness all of it together body mind is atma this collection but if you keep the collection of the parts separately is that a chariot you keep a wheel here and the axle there and another wheel there is that a chariot no that's just a collection of parts there's no chariot there similarly in the continuously changing body mind body and mind which collection are you talking about and if you collect them like that which which is the atma hmm. the <clears throat> i would be i'd say along the lines of much like the problem with the chariot analogy is the fact that there's not a conscious mind to it there's not a brain or cpu if you're say a robot would probably be a bit better with an ai in it So that might be a better analogy just because it can it's capable of thinking even if it doesn't have AI it, you can give it artificial AI which would be just like um not real AI just artificial like you know you ask it a, like when you ask you know uh your smartphone um like what's the temperature it goes and it's like what 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 does it mean it's like oh what's the temperature it means you need to go look at the weather and just give them this information kind of that's artificial AI or whatever you want to call that So in terms of that you'd say like the you have a robot with arms legs head the CPU chip the art, the artificial intelligence in there ram hard drive and all that all of its collection of parts but the CPU the chip that gives it the artificial AI would be the atma 
at the uh, Atma at the um, at the robot. Without that, it has it just is a collection of parts without it being able to function. The chip itself would be the Atma that provides it the illumination of awareness of its functionality. Uh, whether that be just sit there wait until someone says, "Hey, G." go cook me food or something like that you know then it goes okay you know goes cook food or if you ask it what's the weather like and then he goes you know searching for the database he says oh i need to go look up what the weather for today and let you know i guess that'd be a better translation and i'm, I'm wondering how um he would um answer it in this way just because a chariot doesn't have a, a thinking brain it's literally just parts no no thoughts whatsoever on it whereas us um, if we were to say the Atma is separate, our brain still contains thoughts and processes, automated processes for that matter, like breathing, uh, growing. This is something that we don't consciously do. So, whereas, I wonder if a robot would have that. I, it, I guess it could. It could be some automated parts in a robot where it does it automatically and... Um, I forgot what you call it. I'm sure there is something like that where a robot would, or like a robot would have certain parts where it says like your a car would be a great example where the tire gets low, it's like a sensor, or it says oh I'm low, you know, and you know, all of a sudden it lets you know in your car it's like oh low tire. It'd be the same thing for the artificial robot where you know there's still automatic parts going on, but without that chip, the artificial AI, it wouldn't know what to do with it. It's like that the the your right leg is saying it's low on air, <laughs> but no one's there to answer. I wonder if you happen to want to answer that one that'd be great i'm curious to how people think about that kind of question and that kind of answer then the last option would be it is the configuration the shape look somebody might see an exasperation chandrakirti you are a great philosopher you're confusing me it's a simple <laughs> thing arrange the parts in a particular configuration you know that way and that is chariot you think yeah that's what it is right you arrange, put the parts together, fit it together, and that's the chariot. But Chandrakirti says, my dear man, don't you see? Then that's not an, like an eternal self, which is existing apart from body-mind. It's a shape which emerges from the parts of the chariot. If you put them together in a particular way, it emerges, the shape emerges. It does not exist apart from the part and that shape does not exist in the parts also the parts don't look like a chariot the wheel doesn't look like a chariot the axle doesn't look like a chariot if you put them all nearby they don't look like a chariot arranged in a particular way a particular shape emerges that shape you label chariot and you use that chariot that the buddhist and chandrakirti does not deny but where is this in the same way where is this eternal separate reality called atma if you say Living body is there, thinking mind is there, senses are working, thoughts are coming, understanding is going on, uh, happiness, misery is going on. This thing I'm labeling as self. Oh, fine. That's called the transactional self. But there's no ultimate self there. There's no eternal self there. There is no one I who has gone from lifetime to lifetime. No. Not even from moment to moment. In the Buddhist think of momentary existence. This is real, disappears, another one comes up. There's no eternal Atma persisting across um, these, these changes. So even the shape of the parts is not the chariot. So seven options. Uh, all of them, they, if you examine them and connect them to self and body-mind, you will find there's no way a self and Atman could exist in this body-mind. Uh, could, could have any relation with this body-mind. No way you could understand this body-mind which makes sense as an Atma. Okay. Very quickly, we have seen what the Advaitin says. I'll quickly say what, you know, from the Advaitic perspective. Advaita has a very good answer to this. Advaita says, first of all, body-mind is not the Atma. Uh, the first one, is body-mind Atma literally? The first option is, chariot is the parts. Uh, body-mind is Atma. We, uh, and Chandrakirti shows it's not possible. And as non-dualists, we completely agree. And all other Hindu schools also agree, because they want to show Atma separately. Second, Atma is separate from body-mind. And Chandrakirti shows it cannot be so. There is no chariot apart from the parts. Similarly, there is no Atma apart from body-mind. And all the arguments that the Hindus show, uh, the dualists show, they can be faulted because you really cannot show them separately. 
a limited self uh, atma cannot be demonstrated apart from one body mind uh, as vivekananda also says you can in logic you can say i am the continuous witness of all the changes show me in practice has anyone this is his words has anyone been able to show them in practice separately no <laughs> here the advaitin says that we don't actually intend to say that we say that we are saying that you are not the body mind to demonstrate that we show that you are the witness of the body mind but we don't want to say that there is a separate witness of body mind each body mind is a separate witness no that's not the that's not advaita vedanta that's actually sankhya we do this in order to say dehatma vada in order to cut at the root of identification with body mind we have a natural tendency to cling to the body mind and in order to show that we we show that you cannot be the body mind that much only then what what do you want to say what is the non dualist response how do you want to establish the atman the non dualist response is very interesting and it is not covered by the seven fold uh, reasoning of chandrakirti one example will make it very clear gold and ornaments one which i oh. which i use you have bracelets you have necklaces you have rings and they are all made of gold somebody comes and tells you that um, the reality is gold not the reality is not actually a bracelet or a bracelet ring necklace they are names they are particular forms they are uses Bra- bracelet looks like this you put it on your wrist necklace looks like this you put it on your neck ring looks like this you put it on your finger so there's a names are different forms are different uses different but the material the reality of all of them is gold that's the golden ne- uh, ornament example which advaita favors now apply to the seven fold reasoning you will see immediately what it means Uh, is there um uh, uh, is gold the same as the uh, necklace no point one gold is not the same as the necklace gold can be the um, ring also gold can be the bracelet also gold can be something else then second is is gold something apart from the ornaments no that is the beauty of it when you say gold is something different from the ornaments what the advaitin means is not that gold is another type of ornament there is a it is a separate reality separate reality immediately we think that oh so there is a body mind atma advaita says not like that you can never say necklace bracelet ring gold you can't do that it's not a separate ornament but is it separate in in a very deep sense certainly because it is the reality which appears as go as necklace bracelet ring you you the one and uh, one limitless consciousness are the reality which appears as the waker and your waking world as the dreamer and your dream world as the deep sleeper and the blankness of deep sleep we are not saying the waker is somebody separate from the entire waking world and body mind no 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 uh, the waker and the waking world including body mind they appear in one awareness one limitless awareness chandrakirti says ah so you are saying that the atman is the basis the ground it contains body mind no again it's not that gold is like a bowl in which a necklace has been put <laughs> it's not like that it's not like that swami vivekananda himself says how advaita settles this problem this is not that there is a rope in which there is a snake it is the rope alone which is mistaken to be the snake it is the gold alone which is taken as the necklace it's not that gold is a separate thing in which a necklace has been put that option also is rejected uh, so it's not like that it doesn't fall in that category the fourth category the opposite also is there a gold in the necklace in the bracelet in the ring like you said there is a chariot in the <coughs> parts uh, is the atma in the body mind you might say if that inadvertently we might agree yes yes there is gold in the necklace but that's not true it's not that there is a necklace in which some gold has been put <laughs> it's not that there is a wave in which some water has been put yeah. it is the gold alone with a particular name form and function it's a necklace another name form and function which is the bracelet it is the water alone which appears as wave small big foam um, uh, you know drops of water tsunami waves all are that water only it's not that water is something in which Uh, wave has been put or a wave is something in which water has been put so those are the third and fourth options in the chariot example seven fold reasoning is uh, atma pure consciousness brahman the possessor of body mind 
Again, use the gold and uh, necklace example. Is gold the possessor of a necklace? Does gold go around wearing a necklace? <laughs> no. <laughs> They're not two separate entities. Again, you see that example uh, answers the question. So is the chariot just the parts, the collection of the parts? There's no chariot, which is a collection of the parts. Is the Atma the collection of all of this together? All put all of them together is called Atma. All the necklaces together, necklaces and um, um, bracelet and ring together, is it called gold? No. Gold can exist without, you melt all of them. Destroy all the necklaces, just melt them down to still be gold. Change them into tiaras or whatever, still be gold. So gold is not a collection of the golden or or ornaments. And uh, finally, it's the shape, more so. And gold is not the shape of a necklace or a shape of a bracelet. It's not a form, not a particular form which is called uh, gold. No more than a chariot is a particular uh, sh shape emerging out of uh, parts. So the sevenfold reasoning, it is effective against the individual self which is put forth by the dualists uh, and it's difficult to answer. So this is one of the most sophisticated attacks of the uh, Mahayana Buddhists against the uh, concept of a Atma. But it, the Advaitic idea of self, the philosophy of self, Atma, slips through this net. I say I wrote that it slips through Chandrakirti's net. Uh, what actually Chandrakirti would have made of this uh, we don't know because he never got a chance to engage with the non-dualists, uh, with the Advaitins. Uh, but one can see how... Sorry. Um, are there not any Buddhists now that could potentially answer that question? I mean, I mean, it kind of sucks that he couldn't answer it. Uh, I mean, I guess it took a while for that idea to come through to finally defeat perhaps uh, his, um, his sevenfold uh, questions. But is there not a Buddhist today or someone who's not a non-dualist to answer that question? Uh, with the Advaitins. But one can see how amazingly similar um, the Madhyamaka Buddhism of Tibet, uh, of Indo-Tibetan Indo Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta, they're very similar, often using the same language. It's like they're, they're not exactly the same, but they use like mirror images. Uh, one states the same truth uh, negatively, the other one, the Advaitins, try to state the same truth positively. The danger of each is this. If you try to state it negatively, the danger is that you will be taken for a nihilist, that you are ultimately saying nothing exists. It's unfair because Nagarjuna himself has said, we are not Asadvadins, that we are not saying that nothing exists. Those who misunderstand emptiness in this way, he says, Yatha Sarpo Durgrihita, this is a quotation from Nagarjuna, Mula Madhyamaka Karika as a serpent falsely held. If you hold a serpent in the wrong end, you're going to get bitten. If you misunderstand emptiness as nothing, you're going to get bitten. <laughs> you will not attain liberation or nirvana. Um, the problem of misunderstanding emptiness is that you end up with nihilism, nothing. The problem of misunderstanding Advaita, non-dual Vedanta, is that you end up with something. You think that Brahman is a thing, Atman is a thing. Huh. It's not a thing. It's more real than it's nothing. No, it's not nothing either. It's more real than nothing and more real than things also. So I always put it this way, it is no thing. No thing. And this is something acceptable to both sides. If you say At Atman, Brahman is no thing, what do I mean by that? It's not an object. To them, if you say it's no thing, then they will understand that it's not, you're not talking about an eternal reality, you're not talking about n nothing, you're not talking about interdependent existence of the, the um, transactional reality, what Nagarjuna called Samritti Satyam. So it will be acceptable to both. Swami Saradanandaji, in his biography of Sri Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna the great master, he says, what the Buddhists call emptiness, we call fullness. He says, what they call Shunyam, we call it Purnam. Would the Buddhists agree? One book, was remarkable book, was suggested by a Buddhist scholar and practitioner recently, which I got, Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness. Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness uh, by a modern Tibetan Lama who has written this. He just, a tiny book, he sums up the entire range of Buddhist teaching in five stages. 
of understanding deeper and deeper understandings of emptiness first understanding is the theravada understanding that there is a mass of change outside there is a mass of change in the body and the mind here there is no self that is the emptiness of the self first stage of understanding then he teaches how you meditate on that what are the benefits of that second stage of understanding the mind only school yoga chara vigyana vada who says no no there is no mass of change outside it's all in the mind the mind is a series of changes and in that appears a changing external world there is really no external world at all it's all in the mind it's a series of changes and that's that's the and creates an illusion of a continuous self mind only school chitta matra mind only or vigyana vada and these are different names yoga chara vigyana vada very ancient school going back nearly to vasubandhu 1600 1700 years that's the second stage of emptiness there is no world also it's an appearance in the mind third stage of emptiness there is no mind also <laughs> that is the madhyamaka school the emptiness school like i think i think um everything appearing in the mind is kind of somewhat similar to my perspective kind of like how uh, how you know me touching my hands like that i'm not experiencing it right here it's a matter of fact the signals being sent down my arm into my brain my brain is registering that and then my awareness is aware of it so it must manifest in my awareness so things must manifest in my awareness for it to exist for me um so if if i'm not aware of it then it doesn't exist um if i'm not aware of the pain then it doesn't exist in a sense even though it's happening but it doesn't exist to me because i'm not aware of it it seems kind of similar I, i i don't know much about that school though world is empty mind is empty how do you understand that remember the two sheaves of hay leaning on each other remove one the other one also will fall then what's real won't say keep quiet if you say it you are wrong like nagarjuna said if you say something and cut it down remember the four four logic hmm. what will you say you will say either it is wrong it's not wrong it is and is not wrong <laughs> neither is nor is not wrong so all those things he will prove wrong so you, the emptiness school says neither there is a the a real world a mind which imagines a world not there is an external world so emptiness of world and um the emptiness of the self of the mind and then among them the madhyamaka emptiness school there are two varieties and these varieties developed in tibet actually they say that it was in india but they generally developed it in tibet one is called uh, swatantrika madhyamaka another one is called prasangika madhyamaka the independent argument school and the consequentialist school i will not go into that it's a huge huge debate the books and books have been written on it and the tibetans spent some 500 years fighting over it uh, so it's it's a huge subject but basically the first school says emptiness of the world emptiness of the self the last one the prasangika madhyamaka fourth school of emptiness uh, they say that emptiness of emptiness emptiness is also empty <laughs> don't take shunyata as an reality i'm just saying this one thing but it's it's too complex to say uh, but that prasangika madhyamaka is the final school of buddhist tibetan thought which is prevalent now i just want to say real quick it almost sounds like it's water or wet <laughs> it's water or wet that's what if you go to learn buddhist philosophy from the um, dalai lama and his teachers and the teachers there they will teach you prasangika madhyamaka In fact in Tibet one way of cutting you down is to accuse you of being a swatantrika madhyamaka the independent argument middle path emptiness school All right So what what remains the last stage fifth one what this um, lama calls maha madhyamaka the great middle path it's called the shentong it's something that was suppressed the books were burned the monasteries were destroyed and converted into the consequentialist school so there's some history behind it but whatever survives if you look at it what do they say yes everything is empty fine emptiness of emptiness also but then where is it all happening what is the truth of all of that he says there is this they say basic space of awareness in in which everything arises like dreams like constructions and fabrications uh, like clouds 
g- gathering together in a vast blue sky in this we use these terms in the clear light of the void all of samsara and nirvana are arising and falling together you go from samsara to nirvana by practicing all this and then you realize both are appearances even nirvana is not real reality is this vast unlimited basic space of awareness which is literally the translation of the advaitic chidakasha this literally a very beautiful term the sky of consciousness sky of awareness so literally atman or brahman <laughs> so at that stage the final development the mahamudra and this is something the consequentialist uh, madhyamaka the prasangika madhyamaka will not admit they will say our development is the last and the what i studied at harvard suggested that our development is the last but the lama outside harvard said it's the same and what he meant was this last final stage this last final stage literally the two come together the advaita vedanta the final development of advaita vedanta and the final development of tibetan buddhism they come together in this non dualist they will call it emptiness we call it fullness they call it pure awareness we call it pure awareness <laughs> and they say that is the very nature they call it the buddha nature we call it brahman and that is that buddha nature there it's there for everybody all the time in fact everybody is an appearance in that that's the only thing that there really is but only thing that really is you can imagine chandrakirti songkhap and all in uh, alarm thing is no 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 you can't say <laughs> such things <laughs> i will end with sri ramakrishna we'll give the last word to sri ramakrishna in the collection of sayings of sri ramakrishna the first saying collected by swami brahmananda is sri ramakrishna devotee uh, hindu of hindus devotee of kali the his choicest sayings and in that number 1 he says when you know yourself you know god all right that's still pretty hindu the next that's advaitic the next he says what do you mean knowing yourself inquire into yourself where is this i in this body mind he says is it the hands is it the flesh is it the blood the bones as you inquire into the body and into the mind he says i'm quoting from him you will find there is nothing corresponding to the i he says it's empty this is tibetan buddhist not even um, nagarjuna's language this is the language of chandrakirti of songkhapa and others it is empty he says it's like peeling an onion you peel it and peel it and you think you'll come to an essence and that would be the hindu thinking you peel off physical vital mental intellectual and the causal body you come to atma no 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 he says you keep peeling you find nothing and if he stops at that point he would be perfectly acceptable as the next song kapa i think <laughs> but then he adds one more thing he says what remains is consciousness atma that's where it comes together again somebody in the presence of sri ramakrishna said buddha was an uh, literally the word is nastic atheist who did not accept the ultimate reality and sri ramakrishna said in bengali nastic kano hote jabe go mukhe bolte parini why should he be an atheist uh, atheist is too narrow a term who does not accept that there is an ultimate reality nastic literally means one who doesn't accept the vedas and that is true buddha did deny at least the ritualistic mm-hmm. portion of the vedas but Oh, uh, that's right. He uh, he didn't like, or at least from the teachings that he was taught, from what I've heard from the comments, he didn't like. It's not necessarily that all the Vedas. I I don't believe. It's more along the lines of what's being taught around him at the time wasn't sufficient enough. It wasn't good enough. Sri so Ramakrishna says, "Why should he be a Gnostic? Why should he be an atheist? Huh? He could not express what he found in language." And then he says something. Which is startling. Osti nasti majhe shay thik thik. That means where it is between um, is not and is between eternalism and between nihilism. The middle path between that that is precisely it. Now, 
today after listening to uh, the tibetan lamas and professor garfield and reading enormous amounts of handouts i can say the same thing how did sri ramakrishna say this because of all the things he was exposed to he was never exposed to tibetan buddhism if he had said it is beyond existence and non existence beyond that's a very hindu language gita says this nasat uh, nasad uchyate the brahman is not that something which is manifest or something which is unmanifest beyond the manifest and the unmanifest is brahman krishna says this to arjuna in the gita but between that language of between eternalism and uh, nihilism between asti and nasti that between language is peculiarly um, buddhist and that also peculiarly tibetan buddhist so yes um so at that point we will leave it and i think <laughs> Yeah so this is sort of in in some of what about uh, we studied and what i went through and what i feel is my conclusion and i think we can't look to the ancients for a conclusion because shankara and chandrakirti did not meet and songkhapa did not meet madhusudan saraswati and others it's we have to do that groundwork a few traditional um advaitins would agree with this many would not many tibetan lamas would not agree with it but if you ask tibetan lamas of their view of advaita vedanta i mean that lama said it's the same but scholarly view they would say no it's a kind of eternalism they they say there is something called atma brahman separate from everything which exists but if you look deeply that's not what we are saying this reality the very re- nature of this reality is brahman yeah is it yeah. they will say samsara nirvana are the uh-huh. same finally we also agree hmm. gaudapada says there is no cessation no origination no bondage no liberation no one um, making an effort for liberation and no one who is liberated this is the final truth nagarjuna would give 100% marks to that they would shake hands <laughs> uh, let me do a peace chant om shanti 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 hi hari hi om tat sat ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾರ್ಪಣಮಸ್ತು ಸಲ್ಯೂಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹೋಲಿ ಮದರ್ ಮಾ ಶಾರದ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಬುದ್ಧ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಆಚಾರ್ಯಸ್ ನಾಗಾರ್ಜುನ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಚಂದ್ರಕೀರ್ತಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಂಖಾಪ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶಂಕರ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅದರ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ದೇ ಮೇ ಬ್ಲೆಸಸ್ ವಿತ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ವಿಷನ್ ವಿತ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಇಂಟುಯೇಟಿವ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಲಿಬರೇಟ್ಸ್ ಅಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸಫರಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸಂಸಾರ and which liberates us from samsara into nirvana and from which perspective we see we can see that both samsara and nirvana are appearances in the reality that we are our own inner reality good okay very interesting again i i think i've asked this in the past before it in some videos we did a comparison with the uh, advaita vedanta and uh buddhism like it it from the things i've heard were just so similar except for the just that last part um that it's like nope there's nothing and avit uh, vedanta says there's just oneness or eternity or limitless brahman and uh and everything's an appearance in brahman or everything is brahman because it's an appearance in brahman I know someone likes to hear me say everything's an appearance in brahman I, to to me those are two ones in the same if, if it's an appearance in brahman it's an illusion but it is still brahman itself that's causing their appearance because <laughs> otherwise it, it would not be there I, i would assume unless something can appear separate from brahman so that's the reason why i say it's it's also brahman's because without brahman this illusion cannot appear kind of like how you gave the desert example and how I thought about that in the shower uh before I read your comment and um and how uh, it's like the illusion is there but it's not but the thing is though is that the heat and the desert and the the sand must have a particular angle for the illusion to appear so without the desert without the heat the illusion wouldn't be there so brahman being the heat the desert and the sunlight all that must come together to form that illusion. So the illusion is brahman in my opinion because without brahman there is no illusion. You cannot have illusion without brahman. So maya is brahman. Everything appearing in brahman is still brahman. It may be an appearance but without brahman there's no appearance. I hope that kind of clears it up. <laughs> so I hope we have a understanding of what it is. And if I'm still wrong, let me know. 
I do, I do get the emails and I do read them. So I'm, I'm hoping that we're we're getting closer together, kind of like Buddhists and uh, Advaita Vedanta, you know, say we're gonna we're gonna get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's my reaction to Vedant uh, the Vedantic self, Buddhist, non-self. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.